invite you to join me, please, as we read our call to worship responsibly. <laughs> On this fourth Sunday of Lent, we come trusting in God's mercy and love, longing to learn more about God's ways. We come to be guided in the ways of God's truth, to experience the joy of God's salvation. We come aware of God's patience with us and God's steadfast love and provision for us. Lead us, O God, to wait for the newness you promise each and every day. Good morning and welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church. I'm glad each of you has chosen to join us this morning on the fourth Sunday of Lent. This morning as we worship, we'll be talking about newness, uh, new messages we have to share, new strength we have to sustain us, new lives out of which to speak. And it's an important topic on this one year anniversary of the tornado that has impacted so many of us so personally. Uh, and that over the intervening year has given all of us chances to experience newness in all kinds of different ways, whether we've actually wanted to experience that kind of newness or not, and a year that has hopefully given all of us a new appreciation for all of the blessings of God. As we worship this morning, we welcome all of you who are visiting with us today. Uh, we are especially delighted that you've chosen to spend this hour with us, and while you're here today, we hope You'll let us ask one favor of you. We hope that you'll take a welcome to Central card from the pew rack in front of you. Take just a moment to fill it out with basic information about yourself and then drop that completed card into the offering plate as it comes by you later in our worship service. Let that card be your offering to us today uh, so that we can have a record of your presence and have an opportunity maybe to welcome you a bit more personally to Central Baptist Church and share with you some of the ministries uh, of Central that we think you might be interested in. Uh, we gather for worship every week at Central because we believe that the shared experience of God here in this place and in this hour has a special power to transform us. So my prayer for you and my prayer for me is this morning as it is every week that God might find a way to use these next few minutes to change us. <laughs>
reading of the litany based on Psalm 32. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven. Happy are those whom, to whom God attributes no wrong. Those in whose heart there is no deceit. When we keep silent about our wrongdoings, our lives become filled with worry and guilt. When we struggle to hide from God, the heaviness in our hearts consumes our strength. But when we seek your truth, O God, and acknowledge our sin, we experience your forgiveness. Let all people reach out to you in prayer, O God, and know your protection and strength. Surrounded by your grace, we sing your praise. We shout for joy. We put our trust in you, O God. We are surrounded by your steadfast love. Rejoice and shout for joy. show off your muscles or strength. Y'all kind of get the idea here? So if you're bragging or showing off, you are not being meek, okay? And by the way, Mr. Matt challenged me in the early service, asking me if I knew what the word meek in Greek is, and of course I do, <laughs> it is prows. Hey, so now y'all learn that. <laughs> Actually, I had to ask Siri. Siri doesn't translate to Greek either, if you wanted to know, so I had to actually go look it up. <laughs> so, meek is a really good word to describe Jesus. Jesus is the most powerful person we know, right? Because Jesus is God. Is that right? So, 
But um, to, to describe Jesus as meek using the Greek word, let's see if it works. He is exactly like the Greek definition of meek because Jesus had lots of power and Jesus was always careful with his power, right? Didn't brag about it, didn't show off with it, was always careful with his power. Now, don't get me wrong, we should work hard, try hard, do our best. We all have gifts to share with the world because God gave us gifts, right? But we just don't want to show off with those gifts. Yeah. So God is not impressed when we show off, but God is impressed when we use our gifts and talents to help one another and to love one another. Real quick, the second part of the Beatitude says, For they will inherit the earth. That is a fancy way of saying they will get the reward. So, blessed are the meek, for they will get the reward. So Jesus is saying that when we use our gifts and our talents to love one another and help one another in a gentle, quiet, loving way, we are choosing to do what Jesus did, to follow Jesus. And believing in Jesus and following Jesus is the only way to get the reward that Jesus offers us. And that reward is to live forever in heaven with him one day. Right? So we should follow Jesus and be careful with our gifts, our talents, and our power. And only use them for good. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us gifts and talents to use and do good in your kingdom here on earth. Help us to use them for good and to not show off with them. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Joshua, chapter 5. The Israelites have entered into the promised land. Hear this reading from God for us today. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the fourteenth day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and and roasted grain. The manna stopped that day. After they ate this food from the land, there was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, as we travel through this season of Lent, we use this time in prayer to remember the powerful words you proclaimed at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. You proclaim those who are meek will inherit the earth, those who are gentle and kind, those who use their power, their gifts and talents, their wealth for good in the world. All of these will be blessed, will inherit the earth and all that you offer when you gave your life for ours. Lord, you blessed the meek and promised them the earth, but so often we are far from meek. We forget this instruction and we use our strength to make others weak. We use our power to put others down. We use our wealth to make others feel poor. We use our gifts and talents to promote ourselves instead of building others up to their potential. We forget the forgiveness that was won at such a cost, and we hold grudges at the slightest offense. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget the blessings you so freely offered us. Forgive us those times when we try to be all-powerful, making the world our own 
through pride and self-promotion. Lord, may you hear now our silent confessions. May we remember the gentle, patient, steadfast love God promises each one of us. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Dear God, thank you so much for this community and the growth over the last year. Please accept these tithes and offering to help us to continue grow to grow in your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Thank you, choir. Do you have anybody in your life who is constantly coming behind you to clean up after you if you haven't done something right, maybe, or to undo the work you've done so that it can be redone again in a slightly different way, like loading the dishwasher, maybe? <laughs> does, it, does this happen in any of your homes? Dinner is over. You're at the sink, putting dishes in the dishwasher. Someone else is wiping down the table and the counters, putting food back in the pantry. Now, you've been loading the dishwasher, mind you, successfully for literally decades, right? <laughs> Almost every night. You know how to do it. Plates go here, bowls go here, utensils go there, you know, cooking equipment, pots and pans go somewhere else. There's a place for everything, right? And you have a system. It's a thoughtful system. It both maximizes the space available in the dishwasher and makes sure everything comes out clean in the end. After years of careful tinkering with your system, you dare say it's a perfect system, right? The pinnacle of dishwashing technique. And yet, each night, after you have carefully arranged the dishes, she comes... Someone, someone comes behind you and puts the dishes in, the plates in, facing entirely the wrong way, and, and the Tupperware down on the bottom rack where it's guaranteed to melt and warp, just generally undoes your careful work. This is purely a hypothetical situation, by the way. I'm just wondering if this happens in any of your homes. <laughs> there have been, over the years, uh, numerous examples of famous works of art, mostly, mostly Renaissance paintings, uh, paintings being cleaned that end up being ruined by the process of the, of the cleaning. Back in the 1980s, the, the Vatican undertook to have uh, many of the paintings in the Sistine Chapel cleaned and restored after years or even centuries of buildup of dirt and grime on the surface of the paintings. Art purists, as they watched this process unfold, just reacted in horror. <laughs> They're cleaning them like you would clean a rug, one of them exclaimed in the papers, <laughs> using harsh chemicals and uh, abrasive cleaning brushes. Uh, in other cases, uh, artists have actually been hired to oversee the work of cleaning, to make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen, and even to participate in a hands-on way in the cleaning process themselves. Uh, but some of the artists engaged in that kind of cleaning haven't just been looking to remove the dirt. They've taken it upon themselves to improve and touch up the paintings as they're working to clean them, taking not just cleaning supplies up on the scaffolding with them, but paints and brushes too. <laughs> so that now what you see are the genius brush strokes of Michelangelo improved upon just a bit <laughs> by a, a second year art student from the community college in Milan or somewhere, right? <laughs> in our scripture text today, something similar to that is happening. Teachers are coming behind Paul to the church in Corinth, trying to undo or clean up or retouch or alter his careful work in that community. This is a common concern for Paul as he writes across the pages to various churches in the New Testament. Uh, this, is, this is Paul's routine. He, he settles down in a community. He finds a town to settle down in. He, he plants a church. He gets it started. He gives them a strong foundation. And then generally Paul moves on to the next town, repeating the process. And when Paul leaves, almost invariably, other teachers come in behind him. They're teaching things that sound like Christianity. They, they may even have some of the same ideas as Christianity. Uh, they might seem as though they have something of the same very faith inside of them, but they're lacking one very important thing, at least in Paul's mind, they're lacking one very important thing. These new teachers who come behind them are teaching things that lack Christ. 
The new teachings sound great. They look great. They're presented in an attractive manner by attractive teachers. But Paul says they don't have Christ at their center. So watch out. That's the situation in Corinth as Paul is writing 2 Corinthians. I'll read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, just a portion of that chapter, starting with the 16th verse. You'll find it printed on the back of your worship guide if you'd like to follow along. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself In Christ, not counting people's sins against them. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making God's appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. This is our appeal. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have one duty. We have one obligation as Christians. Paul communicates in this in this passage to be Christ's ambassadors and not in some kind of hypothetical honorary sort of way ambassadors, but to be Christ's ambassadors as if God were making God's appeal through us. As if we were the avenue through which God would communicate to the world, Christ's ambassadors, that way. And this is our appeal. These are the words that ought to be coming out of our mouths and communicated through our lives. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might be made righteous. That is our appeal. Christ ambassadors. That's our message to the world. Nothing more, nothing less. And Paul writes, this is a new message. This is a message no one could possibly proclaim before Christ. This is a message that has Christ right at its very center. God no longer counts your sins against you. That's new. And it makes us new, Paul writes. And the subtext here, and the larger context of what's going on in the Corinthian church, is that if you hear anyone trying to teach you anything else, if someone is coming through town trying to freshen up an old recycled message, something maybe that we've all heard before, but that is being presented in a slightly different way, don't listen to them. Because the old recycled message can't possibly have Christ in it because Christ is new. In Christ, God no longer counts your sins against you. And this truth makes us new. And your job is to take that message as Christ's ambassadors and share it with the world. I want to say that again because this is about as simple as it gets. In Christ, God no longer counts your sins against you. And that new idea makes you a new kind of person, set free. And your only job now is to live in a way that allows that message to be received by the rest of the world. Christ's ambassadors. There's no need to climb the scaffolding to clean this message off. No need to take your own paints up there with you and tinker with it at the margins to try to improve it. No need to rearrange the dishes on this one. This one is good just as it stands, all by itself. In our Old Testament passage today, Steve's read it for us earlier in worship. We hear about getting something new, too. The Hebrew people have been wandering through the wilderness, through the desert, for 40 years after God has led them safely out of Egypt through the parted waters of the Red Sea. 
40 long, challenging years between that event and their final successful settling in the Promised Land as they crossed the Jordan River. One of the first things the Hebrew people discovered as they found themselves on their own out in the desert on the other side of the Red Sea, one of the very first things they discovered together is they didn't have enough food. <laughs> and they didn't have enough water. And the people started grumbling to Moses. They were starving. They said, we're never going to make it out here. We'd be better off going back to Egypt, living under Pharaoh in slavery. So one day, God started providing for them manna from heaven. Literally, each day, a provision of food would fall from the sky. This kind of flat, dry, tasteless bread. When Jesus prays, give us this day our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is alluding to this kind of daily provision that God provided for the Hebrew people in the desert. Well, it was the same meager rations every day, just tasteless, dry, unappetizing bread. The people grew tired of it. They grew to hate it, but it was all they had until Joshua chapter 5, the words that Steve read for us this morning. Those words I know might not just leap off the page as we read them, but something big is happening there. It marks a big transition in the life of the people. One chapter behind them, 40 years of manna, and a new chapter ahead of them, settling in the promised land. Sense of permanence and sustenance and abundance, land flowing with milk and honey, right? Hebrew have crossed into the promised land. They're settled down. They're in one place. And for the first time in 40 years, in decades, they get to enjoy the harvest of the land. New food. Abundant food. Tasty food. A variety of food. Things they've chosen and grown for themselves. Their own food. Something new. I wonder if we have the opportunity to try something new right now. We're marking two pretty significant anniversaries as a community just this month. It's been two full years now since the beginning of the COVID disruption, and this weekend marks exactly one year since a tornado struck our town and destroyed many of your homes. <laughs> By the way, as we mark that one-year anniversary, I think every one of us is safely back at home after one full year of disruption. Just barely, but I think everyone is home now. We haven't been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, but these last two years have felt like a long time, at least to me. And I feel like we've been eating lots of manna together Dry, meager rations, just trying to make it through, just trying to see ourselves through this period of our lives together. So is there any chance that this Easter season, Easter's three weeks from this morning, we might all feel as though we've crossed a threshold or cleared a boundary, made it somehow out of a period of wilderness living and maybe claim something new? A new message out of which to live, a new provision out of which to share. We all know what polished up old messages sound like, don't we? We come across them all the time. It looks like this on your internet feed. The six things successful CEOs do every morning. Three steps to an improved marriage. Five habits to a healthier you. Whatever it is that's come along most recently and caught your eye. Any of the other stuff we've heard a thousand times before. Those are the kind of people and those are the kind of messages that came into Corinth behind Paul. Said it might not sound like or seem like it conflicts too much with our Christian message. It's probably good stuff for you to do. But it's lacking one thing. It does not have Christ at its center. 
and it's not new. It's been leaving people wanting and lacking for generations before. <laughs> leaving people unsatisfied for decades, just like warmed over manna. In Christ, God no longer counts your sins against you. That's new. That's the real harvest of the land. That will really satisfy. And with that, we really have something to share. In Christ, God no longer counts your sins against you. That's it. That's the post. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do come this morning as people in search of something new. Make us people who are willing to take what you have given us. New messages, new truths, new sustenance, new strength. New knowledge out of which to speak as your ambassadors to the world. Make us faithful in that work. Resisting any urge to clean it up, polish it up, or add something to it. Remind us that what you give us is enough all by itself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We don't end services at Central without giving you a chance to respond to what God may be doing in your life or in your heart. There's a way that you would respond publicly this morning. I would invite you to make that decision known by meeting me at the front of our sanctuary as we sing our departing hymn together. for just a moment, please. I've got a few announcements to share this morning. I'm sorry, Steve, back there on the soundboard. Uh, number one, Purses in the Pew meets tomorrow. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that yet, you can sign up with Katie this morning before you leave worship today. We also have an organ concert showing off our brand new organ with Jack Michener, who's a very talented, world-class, world-renowned organist coming to uh, use our instrument for, in concert this Friday night, April 1st at 7... 7 p.m. Thank you, Ann. If you're not aware of that yet, make yourself aware of it. You don't want to miss this. It's a great opportunity to share our new instrument with our community. Number three, many of you have been participating for the last several months in donating items of clothing and warm weather gear uh, to be sent up to Kentucky with, uh, to our missions partners there and serve the community of Somerset, Kentucky. Uh, John and Nancy Sanker and Susan and Bill Boyd sitting right there have made that trip to hand deliver your stuff this week, thank you for helping in that effort and uh, thank you for uh, supporting that ministry and partnership. Now, before we go, there is one more announcement to make and I'll recognize Ann Chronic to make it.
I thank God for every blessing I have experienced at Central Baptist Church. To be at the piano, to accompany this wonderful choir, to play with excellent instrumentalists and vocalists, to play hymns so dear to my heart, and to play with Carolyn and with Julia. Playing the piano has filled my heart with joy. To direct the music ministry of the church, the chancel choir, the handbell choir, and especially the children's choirs. To work with the men's quartet, the trio, soloists, and our choir leaders. Directing the music program here has been such a blessing to me. To lead our children's ministry and the women's ministry for several years. To share in mission with purses in the pew and with feeding our friends. To work with those whose service involves weddings, flowers, and hospitality. To work along two exceptional pastors, wonderful ministers and staff, to learn from one another, to encourage one another, and to serve this congregation together in a very special bond. All of these relationships have been so very meaningful to me. To fellowship with all of you, to cherish the deep friendships made here, and to remember those saints who have gone before us. My calling and my work here has truly been a gift from God and a very special opportunity from this congregation. With these blessings all treasured in my heart, it is time that I announce my retirement, seeking God's blessings as well as your blessing. I look forward to celebrating Palm Sunday and Easter with you, as well as services through the month of May. My last Sunday for leadership in the pulpit in worship will be Pentecost Sunday, June 5th. To God be the glory for all that we have shared and experienced together. And you, you need not seek our blessing on you and on your ministry. You have it. <laughs> Maybe not our blessing on your choosing to leave us now, but, but know right this very moment that every single one of our hearts are full of gratitude for your tremendous ministry among us, and we all look forward to the opportunity to partner together with you in writing the final chapter for it. We're grateful for you. Thank you, Ann. With that news, just know that this news has been shared with our deacons. Uh, Ann has made this decision in concert with our personnel chair, Mindy Leach, our deacon chair, uh, Mark Mitchell, uh, and myself, and um, we'll move forward in the appropriate ways uh, in the weeks to come. Thank you, and stand with me now for our benediction. Depart now in peace, and as you go, may the God who makes all things holy and whole make you holy and whole puts you together spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our Master, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs>